the trip was an extension of EDU 596, Historical and Transatlantic Perspectives on Anti-Racist Teaching. From July 2nd to 11, participants were engaged in experiential learning, interacting with different stakeholders to further their understanding of slavery, colonialism in Africa, and post-independence dependency. The group has carefully synchronized their thoughts through various course activities and will be presenting the implications of this experiential learning opportunity to decolonization and anti-racist initiatives at SOE today. Their recommendations will go a long way to strengthening the challenging work we are already engaged in as a school of education. This study trip was a non-traditional way of presenting coursework to help students grasp the challenges of decolonization and anti-racist work. My teaching partner, Dr. Michael Gibbons, and I sought to re-envisioning SOE's approach to anti-racism through a global lens using partners on the ground like TOSTAN and Associating Research and Education for Development, ARED, to co-construct learning in Senegal. We are thankful to the founder of Tostan, Molly Melching, and her team for hosting us for 10 days. Uh, I'm not sure whether Molly is here yet. Kiki is, oh, here she comes, she's just joining. Kiki, if you can highlight, if you can uh, spotlight Molly. Uh, Molly, you're just joining in uh, very timely. We're starting with our introduction. And we just wanted to acknowledge and, and thank you for creating the space for us to do the challenging work that we embarked on for 10 days. Here's Molly that I'm spotlighting on the screen. Molly, on the wave. Hello. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Great. So I'd like to acknowledge the following for their contributions to the success of this course and for the time they have invested in preparing today's panel discussion with their respective learning groups. And if you can just either wave or give a thumbs up when I acknowledge you, that would be great. Uh, Josiah Carolina, Mamadou Konate, <laughs> Kiki Val Sognasar, Noel Taylor, Joba Jen, <laughs> Joytris George, Awakan, Angeliki Papari, Fama Gay, Jimila Smith, Amy Job. Dietrich Shuping, Amadou Jawara, Jonel Gordon, Ramata Sao, Nyasa Koli, Awage, <laughs> Nicholas Carabayo, Wali Jawara, Erica Burton, Awanjai, <clears throat> Jaren Newby, Masunjai, Cameron Brown, Say soon, Jai. So many Jais in the house. <laughs> Tori Jackson, Dusu Konate. Kristen Brown, George Jen. And Kiyomin, Mr. who's not here with us today. Uh, we were also joined by colleagues. No, um, I'm sorry, Professor. Um, is Kiana? Oh, is Kiana here? I'm sorry, I'm Kiana. Friend. Oh. Yes. I'm sorry. Welcome, Kiona. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. We are also joined by colleagues, uh, Dr. Andrea Pidman, Dr. Carolina Parker, Kumba Ba, Dr. Michael Gibbons, Sheku Dumbuya. Um, I just wanted to wrap up this acknowledgement by borrowing from an African proverb that Molly provided to us, uh, which is a seed we're sowing in the work we're doing. If your vision is for a year, plant wheat. If your vision is for a decade, plant trees. 
And if your vision is for a lifetime, plant people. That's exactly what our dean, Dr. Cheryl Holcomb McCoy, sought out to do by introducing uh, us to the difficult journey that we embarked on so many years ago. And we're using these students that we took to Senegal as ambassadors. We're investing in them. And through their work, we will motivate more people in the SOE community and hopefully other PWIs to amplify uh, this very difficult task. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Cheryl Holcomb McCoy, uh, Dean of the American University School of Education. She'll take five minutes to welcome us before we continue with this panel discussion. Well, thank you, Dr. Dean, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Ngoa. I'm gonna take more like one minute um, because I don't want to take any more time between um, that wonderful introduction and learning all about um, the trip to Senegal. I am so excited um, to hear what you learned, what uh, recommendations you have for us in the School of Education so we can continue um, learning together around our um, hope of becoming an anti-racist uh, community, learning community, and to hear what how we can um, further ensure that we are decolonizing our curriculum and experiences that we have here in the School of Ed. I just want to also thank you, Dr. Ngwa and Dr. Gibbons and the rest of the organizers who, um, Molly, I think it is, and I can't see, I am pinned, so I can't, Molly, hi. Um, thank you for the spectacular, terrific, all of those wonderful adjectives for the work that you have done with um, this trip and this course. I was talking to Michael, um, it was last week, right, Michael? I think it was last week. And, and my first question was, how can we do this again? And how can we replicate um, this experience for many more students? And so um, based on what I've heard, and I can't wait to hear even more about the learning that took place, um, I would love to ensure that more students, all of our students in our School of Education have the type of experience that the students on this trip had. That is so foundational, it sounds like, to our learning about anti-racism and decolonization from a global perspective. And I think um, I can't, I have my notes here. I'm ready to take even more notes um, and to learn from you. So in the spirit of just time, and um, I just want to say welcome to everyone here that taking the time to hear from our faculty, friends, and students here. Um, thank you for being here um, because this was an important endeavor. And um, just want to say, um, I'm ready to hear um, about what we are, what we, how we can continue the great work that you're doing. I also, and before I just um, stop, because I am, um, I want to also, and this is just a little seed I want to plant. And that is, um, around the experiences that you have learned in this experiential sort of, as we talk about Michael, non-formal education and experiences outside of the traditional classrooms. I want us to think about how we, as a school and a community can ensure that we're embarking on that same theme and some of our programs and teacher preparation uh, Carolyn Parker is here. I know Lizzie Worden's here, and some of our other teacher fac teacher education faculty. Um, it is. I am really intrigued by how we um, can learn from this experience and apply that to all of our programs within the school. So that's what I am really listening for, and I hope you will help me to think creatively about how we can do that um, and to do it maybe short-term and long-term, how we can do that. So with that, again, welcome. 
And um, I'm just so happy to be here. I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Ingwa. Terrence. Thank you so much, Jean. Uh, we've divided this panel discussion into two rounds. Uh, round one will be two, uh, 20 minutes, focus on personal and group experiences. In the first round of the discussion, each panelist will have five minutes to share their personal and their learning group reflections on a 10-day transatlantic trip. And then in the second round, each panelist will have 10 minutes to share their group's recommendations based on a specific area of focus that they have co collectively identified. Uh, beginning with you, Noel Taylor, uh, you just concluded this 10-day experiential learning trip. What experiences were more me meaningful to you and to the learning group that you have worked with throughout the semester? Over to you, Noel. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'd say, uh, personally, for me, uh, and I think for the, the group um, in entirety, one of the things that stood out to us the most is the community um, and the collective nature of the work that is being done, and and it's something that we talked on we we talked on uh, specifically uh, throughout the ten days that we were there. Um, you know, just being um, in a place where many of us have only seen each other in these little tiles. Um, and then immediately going thousands of miles away from home and from family and from the social norms that we're accustomed to um, and being greeted in such a warm and welcoming way. Um, you know, Molly and everyone at the Tostan Institute really modeled what it is to be a collectivist um, place and society. Um, and really assuaged any concerns or worries or fears that some of us may have had, myself included, um, being that far away from home with people that I hadn't um, had an opportunity to be in person with. So I think that's that's one of the, the biggest pieces. Um, additionally, there is um, nothing like the ability to participate and learn in that manner. Um, you know, you can read a text, um, you can watch a video, you can um, experience things that way, but when you have the opportunity to actually be in a place, um, you know, where your ancestors came from, where you are seeing the effects of colonization in real time, um, where you are able to make connections with how things were transferred from one country and one continent to another, and the outstanding effects that that's had um, on us to this day. Um, I think that's just uh, such a powerful way to learn. Uh, it just kind of smacks you. I, I, you know, there's there's plenty of things that we've all read um, that it still doesn't prepare you for it. And I think that goes back to the experience that we all had uh, being on Gory Island, Island at the house of the slaves and, and just taking that moment in and understanding and being at the door uh, at the door of no return and looking out into the Atlantic Ocean and understanding, um, you know, who we are and what we may be bringing with us in terms of that positionality, in terms of intersectionality, um, you know, who our ancestors may have been, uh, you know, Dr. Ngwa and even in a, a discussion post, being able to share um, what it's like being a black woman or biracial woman and and having the uh, oppressor and the uh, oppressed within you and what that feels like in that moment. Um, so there there are some things that are, you know, you cannot put into words and I, and I think that um, 
the people who experienced the 10 days would agree with me on that. There's there are some pieces that we can't put into words. Um, but the ability to, to go there and to spend 10 days with some really, really amazing people, um, some on this call, some still back in Senegal who have impacted our lives um, for the entirety. Uh, being able to have those conversations and those jokes and those those opportunities to learn from uh, each other. It's just there, there's no other way, no better way to do it. Um, and and I think it just I'll start and end with that ability to create a community and how important that is. Thank you so much, Noel. Uh, Josiah. What are your personal reflections or your group of reflections on this trip and uh, what implications, uh, what are the, of your experiences on your personal anti-racist practice? I just want to start my timer so that I know. Um, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon. Uh, I'm so happy to talk to you about the implications that this trip has had, not only on myself or my group, but I think everyone. It's funny, Noel, you said something along the lines of finding out who we are, who we've been. Um, and I couldn't help but resist to, to touch on that because of its connection to history. And as everyone knows, I was the historian on the trip. I, I, I was in my element and I loved every minute of it. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm an undergraduate, a senior graduating in May. Now this course was designed originally for graduate students only. Um, I will credit the very close and lovely relationships I have with professors in SOE um, regarding how I got along on this trip, but I was kind of the tag along, I feel like, and it was I was the odd one out as a historian, but I found true community as Noel said. And being the school historian, I got to see something very fascinating, which was history presenting itself in so many different facets and so many different multitudes. And most of us are unaware of it. So the history that we learned in Senegal is very important to know. Now, the university, whether it can send groups of students to Senegal every year, is a or every semester is is a very different conversation, and that's not the one that I kind of want to have. But if I learn so much from, no offense to the elder professors in the room, but Dr. Gibbons and Dr. and Molly Melching, you guys have immense history in your own lives. You've lived through such intense experiences, and I've learned so much about those experiences through you. As a historian, I talk a lot about the people's history and history through people rather than through systems or governments or, you know, systems of power, but rather through people. And each of us in this room has an immense history. Each of us in this room deserves the opportunity to investigate, to analyze, and to understand that history. And for, the, for me, Senegal was the beginning, the impetus for that for a lifelong continual journey of trying to understand who I am, but also who my, who my people are, where my people are from. And everyone deserves that identity work because we know that most importantly, identity work must come first as it relates to anti-racist practice, decolonization practice. So I talk about history, not in the way that we think of history, because everyone thinks of it as, you know, his story, which is very accurate, or, you know, a textbook, or some white guy telling you about whatever you want to name, because that has always been what history has been. And we can change that. And I think this trip was a wonderful experience, and that it showed me that that's possible. It showed me that you know, history from below. Um, I highly recommend Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon and, you know, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney. 
these books, there's a reason why they were assigned to us this course, because they're, history, they're telling a history that we're not taught. They're exposing a history that is very real, that is very true, but not accessible. And I think the university, in allowing students to do this identity work through their own histories, also um, will allow us to expose ourselves to the history that's long been um, hidden from us, but also, uh, I lost my train of thought, and I think I'm running out of time. But um, yes, identity work and a commitment to decolonization of imperialism. I think those two are very connected, and history might be um, the knot that ties them together. But thank you all for listening. Thank you, Josiah. And I guess what you forgot is to say that, you know, you know, looking at that door of no return, we all made a commitment to call it a door of return because we will indeed return. Jamila, uh, what is the most what is the most meaningful experience that you gain on this trip? And how would you apply that in the policy implementation space and, and other spaces where you interact? So I, I think that there are there were so many unique experiences that we all um, sort of underwent. Um, and just to be clear, I want to make sure that I'm being clear that I'm bringing forth not only my own voice um, as a doctoral student in the education policy and leadership program, but also the voices of my fellow group members, um, Erica Burton, uh, Janelle Gordon, who are both master's students in the education policy and leadership program, and Dietrich Shipping, who's also a master's of arts in teaching student. Um, so these are sort of our collective understandings of what we experienced. Uh, from, I believe it was the village experience. It was one thing to have the opportunity to sit down with you know, Molly and her team, which were profound experiences and really working through um, our, their understanding of well-being that was actually created by having conversations with villagers, with the community. Um, it wasn't just Tostan's um, sort of model of well-being, but something that was truly organic, that truly grew from the people that it was meant to serve. Uh, even looking at their model of engagement and how they have an, a very intentional and long drawn out sort of process. I believe it was six stages. If I'm incorrect, Molly, please let me know. But I, I believe there were six stages to engagement, just engagement, just how you would work with those in the community, how you would look at self-determination. Um, what were their visions of well-being? What did they want for their family? Uh, what was the vision for them as a people? Um, so it was really sort of ground up as opposed to top down. And I don't know that I've ever seen kind of engagement in that way. Um, but again, it was one thing to sit with the team and sort of learn about the strategies, go through the training. But I believe the pivotal moment was seeing it in practice. We actually went to go visit a village and to sit and listen to the women talk about their five-year plan for their village. You know, their, their money-making strategies that they have for the village, how they're pulling their resources and working together, uh, what they intend to plant. And these were women. These were community women leading the conversation but as a person who sits in the early learning space, I think what was most pivotal for me was watching the children sit at their feet, intently listening. Um, and it wasn't just, you know, the girl children sort of, you know, on seated. There were also, you know, young boys at the door. Everyone was sort of listening to the presentation and just wanting to know, well, my perspective is they wanted to know sort of where they would fit in this strategy in the future years. Um, I mean, that was sort of really pivotal for me was just to see the community sort of speak on their own about the work that they're doing. Um, for which, of course, they received support from Tostan to sort of map it out, but it was their own vision. These were their own words. This was their own sort of planning and direction. And I think when we talk about policy, when we talk about research, it's being clear about whose voice is leading that policy, whose voice is leading the research. You know, have we truly done our due diligence in ensuring a multitude of voices were at the table to help us craft a policy before we move forward with it? Have we truly done our due diligence to bring forward all voices, all perspectives, especially as we're thinking about research and whether or not we are leading research studies or we are implementing findings? Um, one of the key words that we talked a great deal about um, as a cohort was positionality. You know, what are the positions? What are the biases? What's the unique lens that you bring to sort of looking at challenges, that looking at the world um, that may skew the way you see things? or may inform or influence 
research that you're doing or research that you're gathering or even findings that you're looking to implement and being very, very mindful about how we individually show up in a unique way and how we may, again, inform or influence or bias certain things. Um, that was very clear, for, I think, for a multitude of us across the cohort to think through. Um, I heard a, a great deal of talk about Goree Island. And I think looking at Goree, and I know we had agreed to call it kind of the, the door of return because we did return. Um, and I believe many of us have made the commitment to somehow, some way, continue to keep returning to the continent um, to continue to explore, not only for ourselves, but also for our educational practice. Um, I don't know, and I believe a few of my colleagues would also agree, I don't know how we do anti-racist work without understanding the roots of colonialism and what it means to decolonialize education. Um, though that's, that's the parent, that's essentially where it came from. Not even essentially, that is where it came from. So I, I believe it's difficult to begin doing the anti-racist work without first understanding colonialism and sort of what took place on the continent and what continues to take place. Um, we were able, we we're very fortunate to meet with a group called um, Ared, which is an NGO that focuses on um, educational practices and helping to further kind of, you know, mother tongue languages in Senegal. And just hearing their story about, you know, being equipped to do the evidence-based research, being equipped to do the studies, having all the capacity, but being unable to qualify as a prime on contracts, um, which essentially makes me think through, well, then who tells the story? of the work that's being done on the ground, um, if those who are truly doing the work are unable to craft the, the final product in the, the way in which they had intended it to be crafted or craft the final report in the way in which they had intended to be crafted. And they may not even be a footnote in the data that they gathered themselves. Um, so I think that was a bit disheartening, but it really made me think through in terms of my own policy and my own practice, how are we always thinking about the those who are telling the story and ensuring that we're centering their voices. Hey, thank you very much, Jamila. Uh, we're now going to get into uh, the third group's uh, opening remarks. I believe, sorry, the fourth group. I believe they put together a video. Uh, Kiki, if you can put that on the screen. Um, George, George and Jaren Newby, you know, they like tell, telling their story through video and poetry. Um, okay, so um, thank you, Group 4, for being present here. This is from my perspective, but I definitely stand on the shoulders of my team. So shout out to Angel, Kiki on production. And last but not least, who's that? Angel? Yes. So, and Jaren, my, my buddy who's going to be sharing tonight. But I don't want to take away from the time, so please enjoy. A biologist. I summarize my reflection on the anti-racist quest to Senegal using the five basic senses that humans may use as an information passageway to the brain. Touch, sight, hearing, smell, and taste. Touch. In Senegal, I felt the warm embraces from people who immediately felt like family. Senegal, the place where hospitality reigns over everything. Touch, I was touched emotionally because well-being and human rights were the basis of everything at Tostan Institute in Chies. And that's where I stayed and trained. I was touched by knowing that there was dignity for all beings in the community. Sight. I was visually drawn to the beautiful people of all shades of melanin. I was hooked on seeing the smiling and jovial children adorned with intricate braided hairstyles. I saw their smiles beyond the dusty roads through hunger and pain. The children were still able to find joy. These sights, they symbolize resilience of an oppressed people. The smiles revealed that the, though the fight for freedom has come a long way, it is still far from being over. I saw the bold and colorful fabrics inwoven into the durable cloth, cloth that withstood wrinkles and held the baby securely on the backs of my favorites, the market women. Hearing. 
As an educator, I heard loud and clear about how we are many on different parts of the globe, but fighting the same fight for equity in education. At Associates in Research for Education and Development, also known as ARID, they spoke on the remediation needed after COVID. I heard loud and clear about the message on how imperative it is to teach using a voice that embodies cultural responsiveness. And during the day and at night, I heard the beautiful sounds of tropical biodiversity. Smell. I can vividly recall the smell of the musty stench that existed in the slave houses on Goray Island. I can smell the oud, incense, and natural body odor from the sweated out people. It took me to the middle passage. As we boarded the Shalut boat, I could smell the salty waters that carried our ancestors for centuries. I was surrounded by the smells of the melting pot of people with many places to go. One of the major differences between us on the Shalup and those that were bound to the bottom of slave ships is that most of us now had a choice and the luxury to move about freely. Gore Island, the point of no return, at the westernmost point of mainland Africa. I smelled hope of a future that holds the key to ultimate freedom. Taste, Cheboudien and Bisap. These are two staple food and drink items in Senegal. As a Liberian girl, the debate is long and wide about who was the best in the battle of Jalaf rice. But the Wolof people in Senegal started the Jalaf movement. Flavorable vegetables and spices stewed down with fish or meat, all used to sop up a starchy rice or couscous we tasted an unforgettable blend of flavors in every bite of Cheboudien, Senegalese jollof rice. Jollof rice easily translates to jambalaya in the dirty South and various red rices throughout South and Central America and the Caribbean. As for Bisap, the rich, spicy, sweet red drink, each sip took me back to the States reminding me of what's bottled in the cooler at my favorite West Indian spots and labeled as sarel, or even when I taste, have a taste for authentic Mexican tacos, I may wash them down with a Jamaica flavored agua de fresca. These are drinks that happen to be cross-continental, cross-cultural, but they share a common source and a story through the hibiscus flower. You can trace the residuals of the diaspora, even through food. I am not the same person I was before I left. I left home with the hunger, a thirst to address what many may think they know. That hunger has since been fulfilled, and I am even more inspired to explore the diaspora deeper through my studies and the journey to dismantle racism in education and across the globe. Jerry Jeff, signed, Awa Khan. Jamrek Awa Khan. I, I don't know what, when you changed from a STEM teacher to a poet, but um, yeah, that was well delivered. And, you know, I got really emotional listening to that. Um, and yes, the Jollof rice feud is now over. So we're going to tell our Liberian, Nigerian, Ghanaian, Cameroonians, uh, whoever is in that fight, that is over. It belongs to the Senegalese. Thank you. <laughs> We're now going to get into this second round, uh, which is going to be 40 minutes. Each uh, group will take 10 minutes to share their recommendations for the SOE uh, community. So uh, as you all reflect over the course readings and experiences in Senegal, uh, what are your recommendations or what recommendations do you have for curriculum uh, decolonization efforts at SOE and you know the shift, our shift to anti-racist pedagogy uh, a few years back? Noel Taylor, you have 10 minutes to share your recommendations. OK. 
Okay. Um, Kiki, will it let you enlarge a bit? Perfect. Oh, oh, one second, one second, sorry. Okay. I feel like I should sing a song or do a dance after Joy took us through her speaking. <laughs> I was I was side texting Joy about her her calm app voice. You see it, Noel? Yeah, I can see it. We good? All good. All right, perfect. Um, and and so again, I am with Group One with uh, Nyasa and Kristen and Cam and collectively some of our uh, discoverings and impl uh, implications and then recommendations we've, we've grouped together. Um, and uh, we, we spoke a little bit about collectivism uh, in the beginning and that, that piece um, of building community. So understanding that individualism is a white supremacist concept, the School of Education can promote collectivism and community through the following. Intentional and ongoing relationship building in classes and cohorts, modeling best practices. Prioritizing learning spaces that don't position teachers as the sole holder of knowledge and mentoring for students and professors. Um, you know, this this was a big piece for us in terms of how quickly we were able to build community. I um, think that one of the discussions that we had as doctoral students, the three of us specifically, um, was modeling this type of community building um, in terms of the residency programs when we have those once a year and really being intentional about the, the practices that we are putting forth and those three to four days um, to make sure that we have an opportunity to, to further build community that carries us through for the next three, four years in terms of uh, graduation. Um, we also talked about intentional disruption um, and questions with that, like how do we mitigate our experiences to influence change? And what is the balance between disrupting and imposing? And I think one of the things that we took away from Tostan and Molly and her group is that it starts in the community uh, and it starts with their vision and developing um, what that looks like and how they can be supported. And so taking that into the School of Education as well, understanding that being anti-racist requires action, the School of Education can explicitly named decolonization and action-oriented systems dismantling, implement indigenous practices into teaching and learning strategies, and look at grading and course structures, policies, and practices. Um, so making sure, you know, I think one of my fondest memories is on Gori Island when Professor Ngua wanted to take the signs down because they were named after the people who had enslaved. Um, and he's like, why are they here? Why, you know, why, why are they still here? Let's rip them down right now. And we did have several people who were down for the cause, just so you guys know. Um, there could have been, I think there was discussion about who in legal could help us out if, if it went down. But um, there's that that piece on being intentionally disruptive and and um I think when we presented earlier that conversation with Dr. Thomas around how do you slay a dragon, you have to do it a piece at a time. And so what are we intentionally tackling and how can we do that within the School of Education to disrupt those systems and then have the ripple effect that's needed? Um, we also talked about positionality and in intersectionality, uh, which keeps resurfacing. Um, and with that, the consideration of, you know, how does intersectionality impact women and in leadership? Uh, Jamila did a 
a great job kind of encapsulating what we experienced when we went into the village and the women speaking about their vision and how that is uh, perpetuated and, and, and is coming into fruition. Um, but how does that in intersectionality of being a woman, of having those specific social norms um, impact their ability to lead? Um, and then how are we preparing School of Education students to consider religion or social norms as points of intersection? Uh, you know, I think I mentioned this, that it's not something that we normally speak about in terms of an intersection point. We talk about gender, we talk about race. Um, but there are social norms and there are religious factors that can come in play, especially uh, ones that I noticed while we were in Senegal. So being able to move that forward. Also with positionality, Jamila also mentioned, what do we bring to the table and how are, how often are we stating that up front? Um, that as we're all gearing up to kind of start writing the dissertation, that's been one of the biggest pieces that we've had to identify as our positionality. And how often are we doing that when we go into classrooms? How often are we doing that when we are encountering um, professors? And so understanding that positionality and intersectionality inform practices, the School of Education can inter integrate opportunities for learning with, from members of the Tostin Institute as a course offering and or prior to taking the trip. They can be strategic with statements of positionality throughout course offerings. Um, I think that's, that's really important um, in terms of who we're working with along our educational journey. Um, and then lastly, access, opportunity, and empowerment. Um, you know, and understanding how access, um, an opportunity opportunity can affect uh, affect how someone is empowered to do the work that they need to do um, coincides really really nicely with Tostan and the idea that well being leads to well doing um, and so what are we doing in order to uh, amplify access what are we doing in order to ensure opportunity and and thusly through that how are we empowering um, teachers, students, all of us, our entire community. So understanding that access and opportunity lead to empowerment, the School of Education can integrate trauma-informed practices during programs of study and model during courses, can integrate multiple opportunities for experiential and participatory learning, and also develop partnerships with the Institute or similar to create peer mentorship. Um, I think that most people in on this call who attended the trip would agree that um, we very quickly built relationships with the people who were working alongside us, whether it was the people who were helping to serve our breakfast, whether it was the people who were taking us around, whether it was the people who were bartering with us in the markets. Um, and being able to have those continued conversations and build upon that learning and the mutual respect and respect and understanding um, is pivotal to the type of change that we want to encounter. Thank you very much, Noel. And I see your program director is here and all program SOE program directors are here. Would like to acknowledge them and you know see everyone actively taking notes and thank you so much for uh, your recommendations. I will turn it over to Nicholas Carabayo and Group Two for their recommendations. Hi, so I'm just going to jump in, Dr. Ingua. I'm going to present uh, just for three minutes, and then Nick will have the remaining seven. Uh, to be completely honest with you guys, I didn't. My Wi-Fi wasn't working and I didn't have my notes up before. So I'm gonna give not a recap of my implications, but my um, my recommendations. Uh, so I believe that SOE has an obligation to humanize and to historicize its curriculum. Humans come with realities and realities, realities come with histories. I think each and every one of us that has been on this trip 
has come to this conclusion at one or other, another time. And students, these students that come with realities um, and, the, that the, and these realities that come with history, this is true of both SOE students and um, to the students that SOE students will work with, if that made sense. Um, fostering a relationship between professors and students is my my primary recommendation because that's something that takes to me little effort because um, the wonderful professors that joined us in Africa did such a phenomenal job connecting with us and yes it wasn't another continent uh, country and uh, we were not at our university and there was a very different context however on Zoom, we were still capable of making very strong connections with our professors, our professors, both of them. And so I believe that, you know, if we have the space, we have to use it. And my, my big recommendation, um, I'm going to wrap up in a minute. Uh, my big recommendation is an incorporation or development of a first year or first semester pre-seminar course, similar to the American University Experience Program designed for undergrads uh, and first years in at American University. So this course's first semester focuses heavily on socialization. Like I talked about in my introduction with my original implications, Humanization and identity work is crucial to being anti-racist and decolonial. And allowing for a, a space for SOE students specifically to come together to better understand their own socialization, better understand their own identity, can be a very critical moment in their anti-racist journey throughout their anti-racist experience at American University School of Education. Now, the second semester of this course is designed to talk about liberation, acts of resistance, forms of oppression, um, and is meant to prepare new scholars to the college landscape, to a world of critical thinking, anti-racist practice, and decolonial thinking. Now, with undergrads that come in with very various levels of education, the, the program, as many of you will know, is very controversial. It's very, uh, many freshmen look down upon it. They don't enjoy it. But I do think that the School of Education would have a, a very different experience if it were to implement um, this pre-seminar or first semester, first year program into its graduate courses. Um, I talked with many in this course and they seem very amicable to that idea because a lot of the concepts that we're exposed to in SOE, some of us come in without ever having heard of decolonization or anti-racist work. Obviously, that's not the case for many of us here because we took this course, but it is the case and can be the case for several other students. And so a foundational course in these core values of the university might prove very, um, very powerful. Thank you. Now I'm going to pass it to Nicholas. Thank you, Peter, Josiah, um, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I wanted to start with this first slide here, which is the uh, Renaissance statue that we had the opportunity to visit. Um, and at this statue, um, we learned that it was created um, almost uh, as an act of resistance in many ways to the um, Eiffel Tower and Statue of Liberty, which are often viewed as like major tourist destinations. Um, and to really show people that there is an Africa that has always existed and will always exist. Um, and so you can see in the, in the photo that it is the triumph of African liberation from five centuries of ignorance, intolerance, and racism. And the family that is there represents uh, a young generation that is rising up and is leading Africa into the modern world. Um, and the monument suggests that the upward mobility and the trajectory of the African continent 
leaving the dark history of the past behind them is something that um, you know they center and name in their work in a way that I don't think we do um, as often here in the United States context. You can go to the next slide. Um, so here um, was when we visit the, visited the Bandia um, Reserve um, and we learned about the, the Baobao tree and how um, this was actually the tomb for the Griot people who were considered masters of knowledge and keepers of historical records across generations. And the people that were stored in here in this tree when they passed were singers, poets, instrumentalists, musicians, and storytellers who maintained a tradition of oral history in parts of West Africa. And the story goes that um, they put the griots in the Baobabs because they are considered sages. They're the ones who reorient the community when there are problems. They are the repositories of knowledge. And if they are buried underground, it would almost be as though we are burying our history. We cannot bury knowledge because it enlightens our future. Um, and I pulled that from um, just an information website on on the tree and its significance. So while we were in Senegal, um, what I noticed uh, was that the, the values um, that the community embodies are ones um, that everyone takes part in um, designing and constructing together. And you can see on the image here on the slide, um, there are um, images of um, needs that the community has identified um, uh, through the community management committee. They look at, you know, what is their actual reality and what is their desired outcome? And what are the needs that the community, what are the needs and the assets that the community already has? And how are they able to transform that collectively um, into a positive vision for the future? Um, and, um, if we go to the next slide, um, it kind of relates to our discussion with the Ministry of Education. Um, it was at the minute, and I tried with this picture here, this was actually from a video um, when we were speaking in a circle with um, the education minister. He was so impassioned when he spoke about um, education as not being an empire within an empire, that the goal of education is not to impose on students, rather it's to, um, view them as when they walk in your classroom as full of assets, full of knowledge, and what they need is not a depositor or a banking knowledge. What they need is someone to facilitate the co-creation or the co-construction of knowledge such that um, community needs are at the center of what students are doing. Um, and I was actually a part of the complex problems program at American University, and I I have many positive things to say about this program, but one of the things that I think um, it could benefit from is rather than the questions that the students have being um, determined for them, the complex problems that they um, being prescriptive, rather it should be a process where students identify um, what question it is that they want to understand deeply um, so that they're able to take the knowledge that they have, the knowledge that they will have, uh, through the theory dialogue ahead. action model, sorry, I don't know, someone's unmuted. Um, through the theory dialogue action model, um, taking um, what we know, um, applying theory, and then reflecting on it as a as a classroom community. What is it that? Um, how do we make sense of this reality? And then taking that and putting it into action not just keeping it within the confines of a course or a single page or an assessment um, is really important. And so in order to create a new world, we can't really do it through a disconnected pedagogy. We do have to enable students to be in control of their own education and to determine what it is that they are interested in, what are their passions, um, what is it that they know and want to know, and then allow them to be agents of change in their communities rather than imposing on them through a syllabus that's very rigid or through policies that, uh, or practices that are uh, very dehumanizing. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And I'm mindful of time here as well. Um, I talked about some of these questions already, but um, humanization is really the, the goal of our, uh, another dimension of our anti-racist pedagogy that we need to um, practice in the School of Education. And um, as a 
as a researcher of critical education studies, I have um, come to understand how um, students are affected by zero tolerance policies, by standardized testing and high stakes testing, by neighborhood inequality, racial discrimination, um, inaccessibility, LGBTQIA issues in schools. But it's not enough to focus our practice only on dismantling those systems and those oppressive systems. We also have to, at the same time, culture and nurture a mindset that sees the dignity of every person, the value of human rights, um, and how we have rights, but we also have responsibilities that accompany them. Um, and so I think teachers can, in this way, be revolutionary partners because students already have everything that they need. It's already within them. And they don't need to be searching for something out there as if they aren't good enough, that they don't um, meet the standard in this way. Um, if we see the, the dignity in every person, then that kind of adds a new layer to our anti-racist efforts as well. We can go to the next slide. Nick, if you can use 30 seconds to wrap up, please. Okay. Um, Josiah touched on people's history, so um, we can just get this slide. Um, and then um, the conclusion uh, rec recommendations that I have are just that students should be um, deeply involved in constructing the syllabus. Um, when students enter a class, they um, have knowledges and assets that they bring to the table and they want to engage in a meaning making process and they want to understand their reality so that they can transform it. And so including um, that element of design into um, the practice of the School of Education, I think would allow um, for a more humanizing experience um, and also an ethnic studies component because students need to see themselves reflected in the curriculum. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much. And sorry if I went a little over. Thank you so much, Nicholas. And I'm going to turn it over again to Jamila Smith for group three's recommendations. Certainly. Uh, Kiki, we can start from slide three. Great, so um, I totally echo the sentiments already shared by my colleagues, uh, Noel, Josiah, Nicholas, um, all profound points um, and something that I completely support. Uh, in addition, I think my group, some of the things we talked about in terms of recommendations for SOE was that experiential learning is key. Um, and I think I heard uh, Dean, um, the Dean reference that this is something that she too would be invested in. Um, I think we would recommend that this be a requirement, not necessarily just a, um, an, uh, but a requirement that all students in SOE take some type of experiential um, study abroad trip, you know, back to the continent in some way. I understand that, of course, comes with a grant or a cost comes with a cost point. We would recommend that the school invest in finding resources to support this type of learning. Uh, as my my team sort of shared earlier, this is something that we it can't be compromised. We have to start the conversation from colonialism, and there must be an experiential piece. I think my experience to date has been all of the recommendations in terms of readings and assignments have been very aligned and very um, pivotal to sort of my knowledge base to date. But I think having that experiential learning piece is key to sort of all of the, the School of Education's programs. Uh, next would be kind of embedding learning across all of the SOE programs and courses. Uh, this was my first time having interacted with so many different students from other programs and getting to learn more about their programs, sort of the intent and objective for the learnings that they were seeking and what they were hoping to do sort of post-graduation. I think having some type of uh, intentional come together. I understand that we're virtual and students in a variety of different places, so that may complicate things, but having an opportunity to connect more with students from other programs, um, hearing about the learnings and information coming out of the different programs, just to understand how it's a continuity between all of our programs, sort of what we're learning. In terms of uh, authentic and intentional engagement, we heard a bit earlier about the collective and how um, Individual individualism really is a white supremacist term that we need to move away from and really think about the collective. And so some of my colleagues that have already uh, shared about the collective in terms of, you know, training teachers, training professionals, and even just the student relationships. I think what my group here was focusing on is 
for those educators that we are training, for those policymakers, for those who are going back into practice in some way, supporting them and embedding the collective in their practices. So when we think about parent engagement, community engagement, um, working with leadership, working across districts, across schools, across states, how are we thinking about the collective and kind of keeping that uh, in the forefront as opposed to um, these are the standardized test scores for you know my cohort of kids in my classroom. We there we therefore get uh, an award because we were able to kind of go above the district standard. But really thinking about the collective um, again, not just on the school, local, or state level, but kind of expanding across that. We believe that there's a role that SOE can play there. Uh, in terms of positionality, as I mentioned earlier, positionality truly was one of the words that permeated all of our conversations. Mm -hmm. So wanting to ensure that we are having an opportunity to more deeply explore our positionality across a multitude of programs. So not just in the doctoral program, kind of, and that's where my, my seat of understanding is, but ensuring that it carries forward in the master's program, even in the undergrad space, where um, students are having an opportunity to really dig deep in terms of what are the various lenses, in some case biases, that they bring forward um, that may, again, skew or color uh, how they see di different things. So as we progress to the next slide, uh, one of the things that we thought would be great for the School of Education to take on was to truly support um, the DC statehood. Um, that was one of the final recommendations that came up. Um, as it currently exists, DC is functionally a colony in the United States, Congress can overrule our district's laws at any time, and home rule is far from guaranteed. Um, it was only a few months ago when Congress uh, and our president overrode the DC Council on their criminal justice sentencing reform. Uh, this must not happen again. The most obvious solution um, to co this colonial problem is to make DC a state. In this measure, American University, um, which should endorse DC statehood, while it is undoubtedly a symbolic um, move, it is more important that we be a part of this movement. It demonstrates solidarity with the wider DC community, uh, which we would like to think um, should be kind of a clear anti-colonial stance that we all take collectively. Uh, and then lastly, and I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier in terms of activating diverse levers of change and ensuring that we are in, we being kind of the school of education are in the places where policy is being developed, where research is happening. So ensuring that uh, we're looking at it from a systems thinking perspective um, and thinking about the theory of change there in terms of how are we engaging AERA or SREE or even working with other schools of education that are training educators to ensure that we are sharing the diverse research that are, is coming out of our institution or the diverse perspectives. Okay. Um, we have a multitude, I'm thinking about Dr. Batista and some of the great work she did through her dissertation where she was able to present at AERA. And just ensuring that the School of Education is leveraging opportunities like that to be in spaces where change is taking place and researchers are learning, practitioners are learning. and. Um, our School of Education could have a major role in helping to shape what those learnings in fact are. What I will leave you with is a quote um, that we came up with, well, we didn't come up with, but it sort of came from our learnings, which is we cannot see change if, if we are not involved in the process, or if we want to see change, we must be involved in the process. And with that, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you so much, Jamila. And and I know you, you reference, you know, uh, SOE, you know, looking for the resources to ensure that we can continue to do this type of work. Uh, I want to acknowledge Dr. Elizabeth Warden and, you know, really express gratitude for freeing up uh, part of her grant to make sure that, you know, this uh, historic trip took place. So Dr. Warden, thank you so much. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Group four with Jaron Newby. Oh, I'm muted. All right. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jaron Newby. Um, 
So let's go ahead and get into our recommendations. So uh, we have our first three recommendations that we came up with as a group, uh, with group four. Uh, so we have the first one is decolonization and bias, training for teachers, staff, and students. The second one is an em uh, to emphasize sequential learning from course to course. Professors should complement each other's lessons, no repetition. Three is the decolonization within cur curriculum, diverse and international literature, traditional histories, nature, and representing cultures. So for that first one, so decolonization and bias training uh, for teachers, staff, and students. Uh, very important because uh, as staff, as teachers, as faculty, everyone is coming from different walks of life um, and is experiencing uh, different groups of people. And so to be on one accord, um, just having that training for everybody involved within the School of Education. So that decolonization, that bias training for teachers, for staff and students, so that everybody is kind of starting off at the same like base level. Uh, with an understanding of what decolonization really means um, and what that bias training um, or what our biases look like. We all have them, um, implicit um, and explicit biases, and um, they can really affect and change the traje trajectory for uh, the students that we're serving. So we just need to make sure that we come in with a clear understanding of um, what our biases are and how we can how we need to consciously address them um, if we're going to be doing anti-racism work. For that second recommendation, so um, an emphasis on sequential learning from course to course. Uh, professors should complement each other's lessons, no repetition. And so again, um, that comes back to being aligned. There needs to be alignment between um, between professors and between coursework throughout the School of Education. Um, and there needs to be a clear understanding of anti-racism um, embedded within the coursework. Uh, so we should, um, as we move about or matriculate throughout our programs, master's, doctoral programs, uh, it should be a building block. Uh, there should be um, a complement of each, of each class as we move through from course to course. Uh, for that third one, so decolonization within the curriculum. So we have a diverse and international literature, traditional histories, nature, and, and uh, representing cultures. Um, it needs to be embedded within the curriculum that is being presented to us um, as students. Um, and it needs to be an implicit and explicit um, in, um, embedding within the curriculum. And so we need to, again, it kind of refers back to that first point. We first have to start off at ground zero. What is decolonization? What does it look like? I think um, some of us, or not some of us, some people may have you know, different versions of what they think decolonization is and what it means, um, but there needs to be a clear understanding of what decolonization looks like. And we need to make sure that it's embedded within the curriculum um, at the School of Education. And we can go ahead and go to the next slide. And so we have um, uh, recommendations four, five, and six. So I'm going to list them again and then um, describe each one in detail. So four, we have the School of Education Orientation for students and staff. So relational building, collaboration, sharing our stories and biases. Um, mandatory experiential learning or fieldwork for students and professors, emphasizing the TOSTAM model and listening to the community. Six, um, diversify the professor pool within the School of Education to represent more ethnicities and races to match the student body. So um, going back to four, so having a standard School of Education orientation for students and staff for everyone to be a part of. Um, so again, I think if you start off with a strong foundation that's going to build you're um, going to be able to build up your program. And so having that orientation would allow us to really start from ground zero, have a great foundation to where we're coming together, we're building relationships, we're collaborating with each other. There, there needs to be more cross collaboration within education. Um, and then sharing our stories and our biases. Again, as I mentioned previously, we all come from different walks of life. Um, some of us may not come from very diverse areas, um, or were raised in environments that um, that encourage you to be in diverse areas and diverse settings. 
And so being in a melting pot like DC, um, we still need to come together, share our biases, share our stories, and to know that if you're going to be a person who, or a future practitioner within education, especially in the education policy space, you need to make sure that um, you are immersing yourself in undiversified cultures, you are addressing your biases, um, and you're, you're making a conscious effort to address those. Uh, because they will affect how you carry out your work as a practitioner. Uh, number five, so mandatory experiential learning slash fieldwork for students and professors, um, emphasizing the Tostan model and listening to the community. So um, kind of echoing a lot of my classmates, uh, we think that um, an experiential learning or fieldwork for students, so such as a trip to to Africa, um, it's not far-fetched at all. If we really wanna be serious about decolonization and anti-racism work, um, it, it's not something that is uh, too far-fetched. It's something that can be done. Um, and then just emphasizing that toast time model and listening to the community. Uh, what I loved about our trip to Africa, um, one session that was super profound is we had a human rights session and um, we pad, we were given posters of what the human rights looked like and there were pictures. And so when it comes to um, advocacy and being able to advocate for yourselves, um, those posters were so profound because a lot of people in the villages and in the communities weren't able to read and write. So we need to talk about, when we talk about meeting people where they are um, and still delivering information to people, uh, we need to be able to meet the community um, where they are and still be able to reach them just in different ways. Um, for my all my uh, teachers, current, past or present, uh, you know, differentiation, we have to switch it up. We have to meet people where they are. Uh, we hear that a lot in the classroom. You have to meet your students in a different way. The same thing goes for um, doing that experiential learning and that field work um, and making sure that we're, we're listening to the community and we're preparing advocates um, within the community. And six is just to diversify the professor pool within the School of Education to represent more ethnicities and races to match the student body. Um, and so that's just making sure that we're not just hiring professors and practitioners based off of them checking the box. Everybody can go on um, Canva and make a cute resume um, that checks all the boxes for the, the role. You can interview well, listen, we have AI and chat GPT that can prepare us for anything nowadays, but we need people who are actually anti-racist um, and it shows within their practice and it shows within them being professors. Um, and it shows within how they deliver the content within their, their classrooms. Uh, and again, just in parentheses, representing more ethnicities and races to match the student body. Again, we're in Washington DC. This is a melting pot full of different people, um, ethnic groups, um, races, all types of uh, different areas and walks of life, different countries. So we need to have profession, professors and practitioners who match that. Uh, mirrors are important. We hear that a lot in K through 12 education is just as important uh, within the higher education space as well. And so we need to make sure that we're doing a thorough dive when we're screening for professors, um, which goes back to that original point of sharing our stories, coming together, sharing our biases, addressing those things. We need to set up interview systems and screening systems to really have professors um, who are going to deliver anti-racist content um, and who are really focused on uh, the decolonization of education within the higher education space. And so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over. We've got a minute to spare. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it back over to um, my professor. Thank you so much, Jaren. Um, I just wanted to underscore the fact that in, in the design of this course, we were very intentional uh, to ensure that we did not re-traumatize, especially uh, uh, black and brown stu students, uh, you know, with the content. And so part of what we, part of what we did, uh, was to create room for them uh, to provide examples of resistance to the historical traumas that you know black people in particular endured 
as a result of rate, uh, result of slavery or colonization in Africa. And that's a lot of what you heard today through uh, their, their recommendations uh, and the experiences that they had uh, in Senegal. Later on, towards the end, we're going to have a minute to hear from uh, Mali. The toast and model uh, really lays emphasis on wellness and dignity for all. Their slogan, a matter of fact, say dignity pour tous, which is in French, uh, in English is dignity for all. And that's what you're in reference here. So with that, uh, I'm going to open it up for audience questions. Uh, all course participants, feel free to, to jump in, uh, you know, if you can answer a question and Dr. Parker, you are a participant, feel free if, if, if you can chime in. And if you can use the hand raise function, I will use that in the order in which your hands were raised. Yeah, Terrence, I'm gonna stay quiet for questions. Let other people ask questions. Kiki, please help me out here just to scan the screen for any. Uh, I will quickly add as we wait, the trip was life changing for me. It was a really fabulous trip and has made me really think deeply about the way we prepare teachers. Thank you, Caroline. Well, so I'll ask a logistical question that is, um, so first of all, everyone did a super job. This was very informative. I'm glad that we will get the deck, right, of the slides. So, okay, great. Um, just a bit of a, wanted to, not a bit of a devil's advocate here, but just want to ask this question for clarification. Do you have to go to another country to experience what you experienced? I mean, because you saw a slice of Senegal, right? There are aspects there that are not all using the, the, the model that you are seeing. So do you have to replicate this? Would, it, would you need to go to um, another country to have the same experience? Just wondering. Um, I wanna say that in one of the discussions that our classmate shares, I'm not entirely sure, they also mentioned Oh, sorry, I didn't raise my hand. Um, community, um, going into the community in DC as part of SOE students, because um, we can learn about a lot about their history here, something that we don't do as SOE students. So um, in terms of answering that question, I think that would be extremely helpful for all education practitioners in SOE to go in and hear from the communities around DC. So you could have a similar experience, just even staying in the same city. That's what you're saying. There could be some elements, the history, the culture, the colonization, um, all of that could be applied possibly to a place that's not necessarily in another country, right? Just wondering. That's my personal, that was my personal take. If someone else wants to jump in on, on that, that would be great. Can I jump in? Is that, or, go ahead, oh, Okay, okay. Um, hi, so I struggled with this question initially because I was asking myself the very same thing. Um, and I, I came to the conclusion that no, I don't think it's necessary. I think that this is also a very unique experience. The majority of this class had ancestry connecting back to Africa. Some of us specifically to Senegal. I mean, me, I know me for sure, but I don't know. Um, and so it's that much more powerful for the students um, that went on this trip. For the majority of us, there was something else on top of this, um, experience and i think that's why it was so impactful for so many of us because going on gray island and going to the door of no return and claiming it reclaiming it as the door of return um 
these decisions were more were even more powerful because of the community that was in Senegal learning. Um, and I think that's another important part. But absolutely, Kiki, um, I think maybe I've even talked to you about, you know, in at, in, at AU itself, there's the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center that many professors, especially in SOE, don't really know about. It's a it's an entire department that basically is in charge of the CRGC Center and the College of Arts and Sciences, which is critical race, gender, and culture studies. There are many professors that teach Latinx studies, that teach Black American studies, that teach Africana studies. All of these professors have such wealths of knowledge that lived experience that could elevate a core, any course to be as impactful as this one. Um, and there are professors at American University that can connect our students with communities in the states or in the DMV that can also, you know, provide the same kind of experience. Because I'm sure if someone found me, you know, like a borough of densely populated Puerto Rican folks that needed help, I would absolutely fight for that to be a place where we can go. Because you would see decolonization, you would see um, racism, you would see all of these horrible things just in a different community. Um, so again, I do think that because of the group that went to Senegal, there is an added piece there. And of course, the other folks in the group can speak to that, and I could be completely wrong. Um, so I don't think that Senegal needs to be the location. It's an amazing location. I highly recommend the location. Um, but I think it's very possible to come to these realizations and to do this important work without necessarily having to leave the country, because then you can get into conversations of where do you cross the line of saviorism and, you know, are we just consistently doing one country every summer? You know, there are just a lot of concerns. So I will say that I don't think it's necessary to go to Africa. Um, and I'll pass it to Tori. Okay. Josiah, I am, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you there. Uh, Tori and Christian, if you can take a minute, and then we'll take Dr. Cohen's question. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to jump in there because I had an opportunity to go on ITAP's experiential learning trip last summer. Um, it was the non-formal education for social justice course that Michael led, and we spent five days in Tennessee at the Highlander um, Institute for Research and Education. And that was an incredibly powerful experience in and of itself. So I do agree with some of the comments that leaving the country might not be necessary, but I think that depends on the topic at hand. Um, coming from the International Training and Education Program, we've talked about decolonization. That's so important to our work, but going to West Africa, going to Senegal, I realized I really didn't know anything about decolonization and the way that I left this trip having. So I think it depends to what end and what's our objective for the course. We can learn about anti-racism and racism here in the United States, but I think something that Jamila brought up earlier um, was just saying that we have to be able to return and really understand the global structures. And I just want to uplift one of the comments in the chat that said something about um, the act of us going is decolonizing in and of itself, going and listening. There was absolute power in um, us being humble and listening and that was so important that it was an exchange we didn't go there to provide we, we came to learn and to exchange and establishing those transatlantic connections i think it's really important so th those are my two cents uh christian if you want to weigh in and also add why we chose senegal or if someone else uh, after christian would like to weigh in on why we chose senegal uh, that may also sh shed some light on that question. Kristen. Okay. Well, I would say um, I definitely am in the camp of that this is a very necessary um, trip. And I feel like I am a person, you know, I'm, I 
am white. I don't, to my, the best of my knowledge, I don't have a connection um, that I'm aware of to uh, West Africa or Africa. And, and I'm also a bit of an outlier in the SOE program um, because I'm not uh, a teacher uh, and I'm not currently in education. So I would say, given all of those pieces and, you know, it was transformational. And I think that in order it is because it is that that starting point and that foundational piece that's so key for for anyone and will certainly inform my work going forward that I do. And I, you know, I think collectively we have all said how much this will inform our work going forward and our learning. And so it's also so, I think a lot of us highlighted how impactful this could be kind of earlier in the program for us. Um, so I think it's the the history piece of it. It's history that so that I certainly was not aware of. Um, and and I really went with um for me, this was a listening journey and um profoundly impactful and full of insight and learning that I still am carrying with me. So can one of you weigh in on the significance of, of Senegal and specifically uh, the port uh, at Gori? Why did we uh, pick Gori Island and not uh, the other ports? May I? Go ahead, Awakan. Ah, good evening. So um, that is the mo the westernmost point. And so with that being said, that gave it access geographically to many other places that needed access to slaves. So that's my um, addition. And if anybody else wants to piggyback or jump on top of that, but I hope that's where you're going, Dr. Ngwa. Yes, I just wanted to underscore the fact that there were slave ships that left other countries and anchored in Gore because of that geographical location. And you know, that was like a final uh, departure point. And so we could have gone to South Africa, we could have gone to Nigeria or Guinea, uh, but uh, Senegal was strategically located and that's where. And this is just the beginning of a journey. That's why we, we started in Senegal. Dr. Cohen. Thank you. I, I think this has been really, really an important part of a conversation. And I feel like the recommendations and the learnings that you all have shared are really valuable. And there's like a thread that I hear through much of what you all are recommending about this idea of collectivism and what collectivism needs to look like in learning in community building. Um, and I would love for you all to give a little bit more voice to what, what do you see collectivism needing to look like in particular at a PWI that has many online programs um, that to I feel like using Noelle's words that we're often in these Zoom boxes on a screen. Um, how do we make collectivism, um, how do we reimagine and even um, per, first maybe imagine and then reimagine what collectivism ought to look like. I, I feel like you all talked about this, but I would love to get even more like specific. Um, I'm sorry, I applaud it rather than raising my hand. Um, but this, is, this has been a piece for me uh, since starting the doctoral journey. And I think part of the answer to that question is, and, and one of the things that struck me that I've talked about many times since seeing um, the infographic in the Toast on presentation, is they had a tiered step. And Molly, feel free to jump in and correct me if, at any point I'm wrong. But the, I count it six tiers of building community, Kofi before any content was integrated. Um, and I think back to last year when we first stepped foot on AU's campus in our residency. And I think how it was such a missed opportunity for us 
to develop the community that we so desperately need, especially right now. Um, I think in terms of intentionality, which which I mentioned, Dr. Cohen, and 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 being really intentional about the way that we're disrupting those systems, even in that strategy of planning, um, making sure that uh, you know everything that we do in those three or four days um, is built around developing the community before we talk about dissertations, before we talk about writing plans, before we talk about um, all of the other really important things that we have to talk about. <laughs> but without it, I mean, like being able to um, sit and have conversations with Jamila and Joy Trees and the way that we were able to do from the moment that we got on a plane and stepped over, being able to have access to Dr. Ngua and Dr. Gibbons to ask questions, to sit down and talk about a PDSA, being able to talk to Dr. Pittman, Dr. Parker, being able to have conversations with us, uh, you know, and I have, I have said in one of our meetings about uh, in one of our classes about determining advisors or committee chairs. I'm like, can we have a speed dating session or something? Like, I don't even know who's available to us or, or what the specialties are. And so being able to have that opportunity to talk to professors, talk to, to students, um, and just really, really build that community, I think is just, that's, that's a piece. And that's, that's the, that's the, the point that we're all together or ideally we're all together. Um, and I know that even in, in those instances, like there, it's not, it's highly suggested, but not mandatory. And I know that things come up in people's lives, but just being really, really intentional about those residencies um, so that we all have the support to, to move forward um, on this journey together. Thank you, Noel. And Nicholas, I don't mean to skip your hand. I'm looking at the time and you know, being cognizant of the fact that we wanted this to last for 90 minutes. Uh, we've heard a lot about Molly. She's been mentioned multiple times and uh, Tostan, and we, we didn't build her into the agenda. But if we can hear from Molly, Molly, if you can take a couple of minutes just to, just to share what, what the Tostan model that's been referenced here uh, is all about and, you know, uh, we really value the work that, that you did for us, both preparation-wise and for the 10 days that we were, but the SOE community is probably wondering, you know, who is Molly and what is Tostan? If you can take a minute to share with us, please. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. I didn't actually realize um, that it was tonight. I, I've been really busy these past weeks, but... Um, or I would have worn my boo-boo and whatever, but <laughs> um, it was so great to be invited and to be here and to listen to all the feedback. And um, I'm really thrilled to hear, you know, of all the learnings, the suggestions, and the very deep analysis that you have done in the different areas uh, that we, 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 we looked at together, we addressed together during the time, the 10 days we were together. I want to just first of all say that um, Barima and Dom, who were part of the facilitation team and all the staff, really enjoyed, loved having you there. And I want to say too to all of the, to the the to both Michael and to Terrence, I think you did a great job of preparation. I I appreciate all the back and forth we had before you you came. And then the students, I mean, everyone, the participants came with such um, open minds and such open hearts to everyone and everything. Um, I've received, I've been here 50 years now and have received many, 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 many uh, guests, participants in these seminars, over 800 in, in the past, since 2015. And really, I think um, you were wonderful and very kind and open to the staff, which is very meaningful to me. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that first. I do think that um, on, in the last question you addressed, I just might say that um, 
for me, when I came to Senegal, the thing that really uh, touched me and moved me the most at being in this country was the difference between the individualistic society that I grew up in and the collectivistic society that is Senegal and how beautiful it is, how wonderful it is, how much support people give to one another, the unity and the support from the family people as I always say, there's no word for privacy in, in Wolof and most of the other languages in West Africa. And that it, it's something so beautiful and that I think we all have so much to learn in America about. Um, and I also think that I started learning more about my country or America when I came here. I do think it gives people a whole different perspective to go totally outside of your own culture, your own you know, social norms, as you said, and to be in a totally different culture. And it gives you a whole new perspective, not just on the culture that you're visiting, but on your own culture, reflecting back on your own culture. So I do think that's a wonderful experience that you might not be able to have if you just remained in, in America. Um, I won't talk too long. Again, I was very moved. And really, I, the word I came up with when I was, I'm thrilled to hear all of what you have said, that the time and effort we put into this, it seems to have been such a meaningful experience for you that it was all very <laughs> worthwhile on our part. It did take a lot of organization and effort to organize all this. Some of the things that I would have loved for you to do uh, didn't happen because things happened. There were uh, there were people who couldn't come that would have made the, I think the experience even much better, but it's okay because I think in the end it, it went well. And just to, to, for me to end just to, with a with the with the proverb that I love, and I can't remember if we used it or not, but it's, you know, Jama, Jam, as you all know, Jam, Jamrek, Jam, Chile Lepaj. Peace is everything. And despite all the protests, whatever that goes on in Senegal, there is such a there is such a society that seeks peace and well-being, understanding, unity, um, and I, it's been for me such a. a, a um, a thrill to be here in Senegal uh, and 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 to learn to, to actually, I always say, I feel like I've become a better person. And it's one of the reasons I stayed. Um, but to be able to share it with people who really um, have understood how powerful that is and how um, it, it, it is, it is, I just think it's lessons to take back to America. Um, and and I, that's what I, whenever I speak in America, I always try to promote that, um, you know, with, when, when I'm talking about how much we have to learn from African society in particular. I mean, I know Senegal, but I also know the five other West African countries where we work. So I just want to end with that and say peace to all of you and hope to see you again. <laughs> Jamarek, Jamarek, Molly. Jamarek. <laughs> so I know we are uh, running uh, eight minutes behind, uh, but I just wanted to take this moment to to introduce someone that I've known since 2001, uh, 2001 uh, Dr. Michael Gibbons. When I met Michael, I didn't know this kind of journey that we're going to embark on. And every single day, I continue to learn from him. Uh, he brings a very calming effect into every space. Uh, he knows how to synthesize everything. So uh, I would be remiss not to invite him to wrap up everything, synthesize everything that we've all discussed tonight and close out uh, this panel discussion. Michael, over to you. Oh boy, what a role for the white guy. <laughs> well, Terrence, thank you. Um, it's wonderful to hear all the voices assembled today. I think this is the illustration of what community building looks like. 
um, it generates this kind of plurality of insights and wisdom, which we weave together and we all gain so much from. Um, it's been such a joy to um, get to know each of my colleagues, my esteemed colleagues with whom we've shared this trip and our esteemed colleagues uh, from Tostan, an extraordinary education institution um, and the, you know, the Senegalese informants from the ministry, from communities, from cultural institutions that we, uh, that we learned from. Um, a couple of aftertastes of our conversation. Uh, one is the power of experiential learning. It addresses all the senses and the whole person, as you saw from Joy's presentation. It pulls us out of a comfort zone into a stretch zone. It complicates and deepens our understanding and it helps us connect theory and practice ideas and action in a very concrete way. A second thought is cultivating systems thinking and strategy skills, shifting from the US to a transatlantic cross-national and trade triangle perspective had a powerful effect on all of our learning. Um, shifting from the events and patterns level of, of the world as we see it flying by in the headlines to going deeper through a historical perspective. We spent uh, hours and hours going through six centuries of history of how white supremacy as a system is built, um, which gives us much more insight into how we dismantle it. And then um, learning about the skillful approaches to change uh, that allow us to not be phased by confronting systems, thinking about positionality and, and spheres of influence, thinking about levers of change and theories of change, and thinking about the powerful role of social norms in helping motivate people to embrace new thinking and new behavior. A third aftertaste might be the importance of building a learning community as a container for deep learning. Um, that has been talked about a lot in the Q&A, and I'll just leave it at that. We find over and over again in the courses we teach this way that time spent on community building laterally across students and their families and faculty um, pays off. The second half of a course is profoundly different when deep community is built in the first half. Um, I would say it's really important to, to name Tostan's critical role in our collective learning. We didn't just go to a place, a very important place and a very powerful place, but we, we went to visit with friends who are deep practitioners of this kind of education work. And that was not accidental. That was maybe reason number one to consider going to Senegal is to be in the presence of a powerful, unique uh, education uh, practicing institution. So anywhere we would go to immerse in new spaces, we need to find a powerful, trustworthy ally in that local space who welcomes us in, who gives us credibility and entree. And so thank you, Molly, and to everyone at Tostan for playing that indispensable role. Um, a shout out for faculty collaboration and partnership. Terrence and I have had so much fun working together, you know, deeply hours and hours each week for the past six months on this, but it's forged a deep friendship. Um, it, has revealed all kinds of connecting points we didn't know we shared. Um, it taught both of us an awful lot. It enhanced our scholarship as individuals. It helped us learn about each other's programs. And, um, but I still think Sierra Leone's Jollof Rice is the best, not Cameroonian. 
<laughs> and then lastly, I'll just say that I hope you see that this is an illustration of a firm belief I have after 23 years of working um, as a kind of contrarian educator in the School of Ed. Graduate education itself can be a vehicle of personal and social transformation. Mm -hmm. It's not preparation for something. It is something. This is what Bell Hooks would say. The academy is not outside the world. It is the world. And, and so if we want to do this, we have to do it, not talk about it. So deep lived experiences of this approach in our graduate work is the best preparation for being leaders and change agents in this kind of work. So thanks to all for making this a powerful experience. This was co-constructed by all of us. Thank you to all the listeners who have hung in there for an extra long uh, evening on a beautiful summer, summer day. Um, we look forward to conveying these, these findings and recommendations into collegial conversations in the strands of faculty and student and faculty deliberations uh, in the coming academic year and years. And we hope it contributes to um, you know, the ripening of a new season of our School of Ed in a new phase of struggles for justice through education. Thanks to all. Mm -hmm.